Good morning. Hello, Dana. Hi, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. You can't hear me? Oh, we can hear you now. Okay, okay, great. All right, pleasure to have you join us. Um, I'm called to win Edward. I just wanted to do a brief introduction before you can begin your session. Okay. Uh, so we are here with a team of journalists. We are in Western Uganda, um, in Fort Porto. So our dear journalists, uh, this is our facilitator of the day. Uh, this is Dana Amihere. She's from the UC Berkeley Advanced Media Institute. So uh, Dana Amihere is a designer, developer and data journalist. She recently left conventional newsrooms to start Black, code Black Media, a digital media consultancy that lives at the intersection of data, design, and equity. Dana previously worked in data reporting, interactive design, and news apps development for KPCC, the Dallas Morning News, Pew Research Center, and the Baltimore Sun. She taught data journalism and interaction design across the United States and at conferences and colleges including University of Southern California and at the University of California, Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism. She's here to support our trainings on behalf of the Berkeley Advanced Media Institute, which is a unit of the University of California, Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism. Pleasure to have you, Dana. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate that introduction. Um, I've gone ahead and shared my screen with you all. Um, uh, can you all see it? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Since you've already introduced me, I will um, move on from that. Um, that was a lovely introduction. Thank you. Um, so what we'll be going over today. Sorry, my computer's sticking a little bit. All right. So what we'll be covering this morning uh, we'll talk about what is data visualization and what are some characteristics of really great data visualization. Um, in the second section, we'll talk about what does it mean to mislead or even deceive with data, um, and then talk about the other side of that, how can you use data and data visualization ethically and use it um, and do it, do it well, um, do it properly. And then in the third part of our session, um, we'll do um, some hands-on work, uh, working with uh, maps in data wrapper. Um, and I'll close out taking any questions um, that you all will have. Um, in the past few sessions, we've had some really great questions. I'm hoping um, to get some really great questions from you all as well. Um, if you have any questions um, as we move along, please feel free uh, to either use the raise hand um, function or just throw your questions in the chat. Um, if you'd like to you know, tell me who's in the room and say hello, um, feel free to throw that in the chat as well. Um, I'd love to be able to see um, who I'm talking to. So if you feel comfortable, um, turn your video on. I don't know if you all are in a big room or not this time. Um, is that how it's working this time, uh, Gerald? Yes, we're in one big room. Oh, you're in one big room. Okay, so there's yeah. one, just one video. Okay, all right, so you all can see me, but I can't see you, that's okay, all right. Um, and if you see me sipping on something from time to time, I'm just, I have a little bit of a cold, so I'm trying to sip some orange juice to keep my voice from going away again. So, all right, so we'll get started. Um, so first part, we're gonna talk about uh, data visualization. Okay. So what does it mean to talk about data visualization? So what? let's set the stage, like what are we talking about? So first off, First and foremost, data visualization is storytelling, um, and it absolutely is journalism. Um, sometimes it isn't always considered that. It's more like, you know, it's design, it's something pretty, but that's not that's not true. Um, it because it has the same structure as a story, as a news story or a news report. It has the same rules as journalism. Um, it has to be accurate. It has to be truthful. Um, it follows the same some of the same conventions. Um, it follows some of the same rules of sourcing, like you have to make sure that, you know, of course, what you're being told and what you're reporting is true, that your data is accurate. Um, 
that you are making sure that you're vetting um, the source of your data, just like you would vet um, a human source. Um, and then, so there is an added layer. So instead of um, like in a, in a news report, um, how you would use, you know, transitioning from, you know, one paragraph to another and sort of lead your, your reader um, through your, through your narrative and through your story to really help them understand um, how to kind of get from point A to point B, how to get from like the really, really important part at the top that you're, um, that you start with to more of the context and the details like further into the news um, report or the, or the feature. Um, we do the same thing in data visualization. Um, the only difference is we do, we do it um, using visual cues instead of words, um, but it's the same, um, the same thinking is behind it. We use those cues to help um, your readers' brains like understand that we're moving from you know this thing to this thing to this thing, but we're starting you know in kind of a hierarchy of importance. And we'll talk more about some of those uh, visual cues later. Okay, so what I've got here is um, a typical like election dashboard for a presidential election in the U.S. Um, I tried to find a better international um, or even African um, news outlet um, example for this, uh, but I couldn't find anything quite this specific for what I was trying to do, so I went with this. This is from the presidential election in 2012, um, where Obama beat Mitt Romney. Um, most news outlets, it looked pretty much the same. Map of the United States, you've got you know your red states, your blue states. You know, the total number of um, electoral college votes that went to each candidate um, sort of, you know, in the middle, like, you know, who was where the line is, like how many you had to get over the line to um, um, to have, you know, won the election. Um, you've got the total number of votes that each candidate had um, underneath their you know respective sides. You can see, you know, at a glance, like how each state voted, um, you know, red for Republican, blue for Democrat. And then over on the side, if you click on these little like tiny maps, um, you see you've got the one um, that will show you the votes by state, um, which is the one you're looking at here. Um, you've got one that says, uh, you got another state map, uh, and I can't quite make out what that one says. Um, you've got one that has um, all the voting by county um, across the United States. And then you've got the size of the lead um, in every county. And then you've got the shift in the vote. Um, in every county from the 2008 election to the 2012 election. Okay, so they've got a lot of information packed in here if you're willing to like, you know, navigate around and, you know, sort of surf around. Okay, so what does all this mean? It's a very, you know, detailed data viz, but how is this like storytelling? How is this a story? Well, if you break it down into the pieces that you normally would see for a news report, um, all the elements are there. So you start off at the top, you've got your lead. Um, you know, sometimes we call it a nut graph or, you know, it's really like the top highlight that you're trying to get across to your, um, to your reader. Um, it's like, what is the high point? Um, what's, the, what's the meat and potatoes that you need to get away? Um, and basically with this, it's who won. Um, and that's here. It's like the big blue number versus the, the smaller red number. Um, Okay, you've got the body of the story, which is basically how did every state in the country um, vote? Was it like who went red and who went blue? And you can see there are fewer blue states. Um, so fewer states went Democrat, but it was the bigger states with more people, the bigger um, states that voted Democrat. So more people, but fewer states. Um, and then the background and details is these, you know, smaller um, um, uh, little maps that we've got over here. So if you click on these, you get this contextual information. Like if you wanted to see other breakdowns um, of the election. So if you wanted to look by county or you wanted to see what the change was from 2008 to 2012, um, all of that can you know enhance your understanding of what happened in the present. Okay, so what does all this mean? Um, so we've established now that yes, data visualization is very much um, journalism. It's very much got the same format as a story. So how do you create good data visualization? So there are some um, pretty basic 
um, uh, guidelines um, that I'm going to share with you as to what makes data viz good um, and what makes it um, effective in communicating ideas to your readers um, and to the people who consume your work. Okay. So one of the first things is you help the people who look at your data viz um, to really think about the what and not the how. And by that, I mean that the content of your visualization really shines past the methodology, like how you put it all together. So they are more focused on, uh, on the what, like what the information is, not how pretty it's presented, even if it's done really, really well. Um, you know that you did a really good job with the data visualization. If it's presented, it's very clean, it's very, you know, very sophisticated, it's very, it can be very detailed and have a lot going on, but people aren't focused on the fact that it looks really good. They're focused on the fact that they're taking a lot of information in and understanding so much from it. Um, so basically, your data this serves a very clear purpose and it's very good at getting that information across and serving that purpose. Um, so I want to share with you an example um, that I found. Um, it's from a group called Our World in Data, um, and it's actually, um, it's a map, it's an interactive map on um, extreme poverty um, over the years. So it's got a lot going on here, and I purposely picked this one because it's not just a, a U.S.-centric example, um, but it's got a lot packed in here. So um, if you decide to you know, play the interactive, you, you've got this kind of drag bar that you can you know, kind of see this changes slowly over time. You know, I can play with it this way, or I can actually play it and let it you know, play, play out over time. It goes very, very fast though. Um, but you can see with the color changes that you know, you've got your scale here, you can see that you know, over time, you've got more and more and more people who are, um, you've got more and more people as you move toward the 2019 um, side of the scale who are not in what we consider extreme poverty. You've got more people who are in, you know, what we consider developing countries, not as poor as they were before. And I'm sorry for the scratching, that's my dog trying to get into the room I'm in. So she'll go away. Um, so, and the nice part about this is you can see this kind of overall picture that it's trying to uh, get across, but it also does so on a granular level. So if you um, mouse over um, one of the countries, and I'll see if I can pinpoint Uganda. Um, oh, hold on. There we go. I couldn't do it the last time I gave this presentation. I got everything but Uganda. Uh, if you look in the tooltip, you've got all of these little bars and what you've got is a mini chart of all of the years of data that they've got um, and with the very last year available highlighted. So it gives you like the small trend over time um, for that particular country. And then it highlights where that, what the point in time is um, for uh, where the country, it, how the country is doing right now. Um, so in 2018, it was 39.91% of people were making about, um, you know, a dollar a day. Um, and if you actually click on the country, it will show you like the very, um, like expanded, more detailed um, chart that it's showing in that little bar chart. It'll show you like the exact, um, you know, uh, points and, and percentages along, uh, along that time. And you can see like more in, more in detail, like how it's gone down um, and how, and you can start to, you know, uh, make inferences about, you know, okay, well, what was happening in these times as to what was causing it to go down? Um, so that brings me back to my next one. So you're able to present a lot of information in a small space. Um, so not only did that last one do a really good job of that, so does this one. Um, and this one is actually, this is from the US. It's actually from um, the state that I grew up in. It's from Florida. And it's around, not too far from um, a couple hours from where I grew up. And I'm gonna share this one with you as well, because I think it, it's really impressive for how it's able to show not just a point in time, a lot of data, but like years of data as well, like the, the last one we looked at. 
So again, it's interactive. And I'm just going to click through some of these. It, what it does is it gives you like little small bites of information at a time um, to like help you understand the story in, in pieces. And it shows you visually what each of those pieces um, helps you understand each of those piece, pieces with like a little bit more of the data viz at a time. Um, so if I just click through my keyboard here, it starts off talking about, okay, so um, most of the, um, the elementary students in um, this one particular county in, you know, South Florida are, you know, are black. They're like 84%. They're the ones who are failing these state tests. And then like every other county is doing better. Um, and then it's talking about only like seven other places are worse. And they here's what they all have in common. They're poor, they're rural. But then it goes back talking about the original one. And it's like, okay, well, this one place has four times as many students as all these other places. And then it starts trying to add in this time component. So you can see over on the left side, we've got um, 2004 to 2014. So we're talking about 10 years. And then on the bottom, um, we're talking about um, the population of students. So we're talking about the percentage of black students. Um, and then at the top, we've got our, our narrative. And then over here on the right, they've got this map component. So they've got a lot of pieces going on here. And the reason that I'm showing you this particular part is because it does a really good job of seamlessly helping you understand how all of these pieces fit together without it being overwhelming, uh, which is really, really hard to do. Um, so it starts off talking about, okay, so this particular county, this place called Pinellas County was way better off in you know, 2007. And it shows, okay, so the schools were much more integrated. There was much more, you know, parity between, you know, the racial makeup. But then as the schools became more segregated, things started to get worse. And in certain schools, they got worse and worse and worse. And then that's how they got these outlier schools. So it's able to, you know, get you from kind of the point A over to the, you know, their, their main crux of their, their point by giving you just like little bits and pieces at a time. Um, if they had tried to explain all of this in like one big paragraph, I think it would have been a mess because you've gotten too much at one time and you would have been trying to figure out, okay, this happened in this year and that happened over here. This is like much more manageable. Okay. Uh, so building upon what we've already talked about, uh, really great data graphics also encourage you to make comparisons. Um, so just like we saw in that last one, it was having you look and um, uh, try and understand how these different schools compare to each other. Um, so it didn't get quite into you know, the specifics of like this particular school is more like the overall pattern, um, but it tried to get you to um, understand like this bigger idea by understanding like these tiny pieces of it, um, like how these, how these schools fit into the bigger piece, into the bigger piece of the pie, into the bigger picture. Um, and this next one does as well. Um, so this is from um, a nonprofit group, uh, nonprofit journalism group uh, called the Marshall Project. Um, and they did a piece called, it's, it's called the killings of black men by whites are far more likely to be ruled justifiable, um, which is terrible. Um, this is the main graphic uh, from that piece on their online story. And this is like their highlight from that piece. I'll read it to you. It says, when a white person kills a black man, the, in America, kills a black man. the killer often faces no legal consequences. In one of six of these killings, there is no criminal sanction. Okay. And the rate is, that rate is far higher than the one for homicides involving other combinations of races. So what they did is they gave all of these other um, circumstances, these other combinations um, that you could have um, these killings. Um, so the top um, row you've got here is combinations of, of relationships. You, so you've got, you know, a stranger um, being killed, a romantic partner, a friend or an acquaintance, or if the relationship you don't know. And then on the bottom, it's by weapon, um, a handgun, 
some other type of firearm, a knife, um, when the killer was just unarmed. Um, and if you start to look at the, you know, the text under, these are called unit charts. So every square here represents uh, one, um, one out of a hundred. So like 1%. Um, so we've got hundred percent and hundred percent on each one of these. Um, so what's happening here is we've got 5% of these, um, when a stranger was killed were found justified. Um, but 34% when a white person killed a black man was found um, justified. So it's like encouraging your, your reader as they're going along to like read these different scenarios and start to ask questions, to start to try to unpack things in their own mind. So you're not spoon feeding them information. It's not that you're laying out the information for them in a very logical way um, that's easy to understand, but at the same time, you are allowing them to come to conclusions for themselves. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about some best practices um, for creating um, some of these data visualizations. So we've talked about what makes, um, what some characteristics of some really good data visualizations are. So let's talk about how to make them. Um, so one of the most important things when you're talking about data viz is uh, color. Um, one of the worst things that you can do is overuse color. When you've got too many colors, you've got kind of a sensory overload going on. Um, so what I've got here is an example from the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Um, this is an infographic um, showing how climate change um, affects the livelihoods of different um, uh, groups of people who are living in different regions across Africa. Um, so each region is highlighted in a different color. Um, and each color is also supposed to represent like a different like strain on a different kind of livelihood. So we've got fishing, um, we've got uh, uh, farming, we've got um, uh, displacement, um, which I guess is also like a, a like in a fallout from climate change. You've got uh, carbon emissions, you've got infrastructure problems. Um, so you've got this, um, you're outlining what the physical boundaries of the geographic region are, but you're also associating that color with a problem um, and then giving like a little, you know, write up on it. Um, so the color is used to uh, complement um, the differences between these different things, but it's also helping to like unify the things that are alike. So these different countries that are experiencing the same thing. So this is a good example. Um, so something that's not so great would be something like this, where um, you're using color in a way that isn't meaningful and it's a little bit, it's overboard. So this is a bar chart of some like made up data. Um, uh, these are like made up team names, you know, dragons, cobras, hawks, rams, um, and they're, these are like fake ratings um, that go with them. And you notice you've got bars that kind of are these gradient rainbow colors that don't really seem to mean anything. There's no key, there's no legend, it doesn't tell you what the colors mean. Every rating, um, every, uh, all the, the ratings, uh, number doesn't seem to make an impact on what the color is and every team has its own color. So how could they have done this better? So if they were trying to um, make a comparison between two teams, like say they were trying to show like one team had a more positive rating than another, you could try and highlight what is most important and like gray out everything else. Or if they were trying to show um, you know, just a comparison between two teams. They could just highlight those two teams, which we've got here, and they could just use the same color. Um, so there are ways to, to use color where it's impactful, but it's not overkill. Okay. So a similar thing when you're talking about using icons and decorative elements. Um, so again, I tried to find good examples, but in this particular case, some of the ones that were um, US like memes and graphics were so just egregious and terrible. I picked, I picked those. Um, so this is an infographic I found online 
Um, what food does your state hate? And this is terrible. I mean, every state is a different color. There's no rhyme or reason as to why the blue or yellow or red is used. Um, all the, the text is in all caps. The, a picture of the food is like the color of the state. And it's like, you know, kind of pushed behind, um, the picture is behind the, the text. So you can't really tell what it is. And even when you look really hard and you know what it is because the text is there, you still can't really tell. I mean, it, it, it's pretty bad. So this is a slightly better take on that. Um, so in this case, we've got um, this infographic, it's called the Corporate States of America. So every, in every state you see um, a logo or a brand that is most associated with that state. So like something that's very popular there or like a company that is based there. Um, and the color behind it is like part of that brand or part of that logo. So if you live there, you're probably very familiar with what it is. So um, if you saw this online, you're probably like looking for your state and it's like, oh, okay, I definitely know what that is. Um, so the colors, there's a familiarity there. So it's not like the last one where it was like very foreign. It's like, well, why is this blue? Why is this yellow? Um, these actually make sense. And the colors, they're very bold. They're very bright. They're not that like muted weirdness with the, you know, the blocky letters on top. This makes more sense. It's, um, it, it pops out more. It stands out more. And it, it's able to convey information without being too much. Um, and if you notice, even up in the smaller states, it's still readable, um, which is also a very good thing. You want to make sure that whatever you create is legible. If there's part of it that your, your reader can't consume, that they can't read or understand, then you didn't do your job as, uh, as a journalist. If you can't, if you can't uh, convey the information in a way they can understand, then something went wrong. Okay. All right. So next one. Um, colors have meanings um, to us as viewers, as readers, as consumers of information. Um, so when we talk about um, like political parties in the United States, we talk about if you use red and blue in a political context, people are going to think you're talking about Democrats or Republicans. If you talk about, um, you know, red or green in like a finance um, uh, setting, they're going to think you're talking about like losses or gains. If you talk about um, like we have here, um, uh, if you're talking about gender, if you use pink and blue, um, people are going to think you're talking about, you know, you know, male and female, like girls and boys. Um, so in this case, if you take a look at this chart, this is really, really bad. Um, and the reason being is because they flip the color scale that we would normally um, associate with male and female. So male in this case is pink and female is blue. And the reason that that's so bad is not um, so much the, the color in and of themselves, it's the fact that what we associate it with as, you know, uh, like as, as readers, as viewers, um, as, as an audience, if you were just casually, um, you know, skimming as a lot of people do when they, um, consume news and you weren't paying attention to the labels, you just kind of read the, the name of the chart and you, you know, you looked at the bars that were longer versus the ones that were shorter and you saw the color, you would think that, you know, oh, male is doing, you know, pretty, pretty well in terms of, you know, gender composition and, um, you know, females doing, you know, really, really bad um, because they're, they're the shorter bars. Or I'm sorry, that's flipped. Sorry, misspoke. I would think if I wasn't reading the labels, I would think that um, female was doing very, very well because the, the longer bars are pink and that male is doing very badly because the bars are shorter. Sorry, I got tongue twisted there for a second. Um, so an example of something that does this um, in a more conventional way um, is this example um, from the Wall Street Journal. So it uses color in a way that um, societally we're, we're just used to. Um, so when people would look at this at a glance, they would understand the meaning right away. So I'm actually gonna click into this example um, because it's actually pretty good. Um, 
move my screen back over. Okay. So what it is, it's exploring the pay gap um, in the US between like hundreds of different jobs. So if you, this is what it, it looks like when you first load it. And if you hover, if you start to hover over it and interact with it, it starts to move and to change. Um, but I'll go back to the, the screenshot of it so you can see. If you came, if you came to this um, at, at first, you would be, you know, it would be really easy to recognize almost every blue dot, it, at least at first glance, is much is higher than a pink dot. Um, so you can see that there's at least some gap between um, male and female pay in every job that they looked at. And some of them are significantly higher, as you can see that, you know, this dot's like way up here and some of these are way up here. Um, and it seems that the gaps get bigger, like the, 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 the spaces get bigger as you get, as the money gets higher. Um, so this does a really good job of conveying that information um, without doing a whole lot because the color is used in a way that we're used to. Right. So something else that you, is really simple um, that you can that a lot of people don't think of um, when they're creating their data visualization or their um, whether that's interactive or whether it's an infographic is their um, info windows or their tooltips. Um, so you want to create something that's informative and that includes includes like contextual information, but you don't want so much information in there that's cluttered. So I'm including this example to show you because I think it's a really good job um, and a really good example of how you can include lots of information, but not make it look like it's just crammed in there and it's like, it's gonna be really difficult to read. And it also, what's in the tooltip plays off of what else is on the page. Um, so, the map part that you see here was actually lower on the page. Um, I cut out this, um, the part with the two um, mug shots here, or um, I guess thumbnail um, headshots here, um, so I could fit it on the slide. Um, so this was at the top part, this was on top, this was on the bottom. So obviously, you know, blue candidate, Democrat, red candidate, Republican, um, can see that, you know, almost every, county here on the California coast voted blue um, or Democrat. Those are actually some of the more populated counties like Los Angeles is the one um, where I live that I hovered over and took the screenshot of. Um, and that's how this person wound up winning because that's where more people are, even though more counties actually voted red, voted Republican. Um, and then in this tooltip, it's really, really informative because you get the county name, um, this was something from their elections dashboard for like the night as, you know, votes are coming in. So it shows the number of precincts that have reported. Um, and of course it's hundred percent now because this is from a couple of years ago, actually. Um, so you've got um, the total votes that were in at the time. So now it's a hundred. Um, you've got that person's name. And then just a reminder, if they're Democrat or Republican, you've got not only the number of votes that were in at the time, but the total percentage of the vote that they have as well. Um, so you've got a lot of information in this one little box um, and it's all associated with that one geography, with that one county. Um, so not just, it's not just a matter of looking at the, the map and saying, oh, okay, like the, there's more you know, red on it than blue, but it's more populated blue places. Um, when you click into it, you get way more context, which is a really great thing. Okay, do I have any questions so far? I know I've been going like a million miles a minute. Anybody have anything they'd like to ask? I'm gonna throw it into the chat or raise a hand. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Uh, or, no, no chip so far. Questions. You can continue. The questions will come okay. at the end. Okay, thank you. Okay, so something really simple that you can do with a lot of data visualizations is, you know, use different styles to um, try and um, emphasize things that you want your viewer uh, or your, your reader to pay attention to more. 
Um, so these are shots from um, an interactive timeline, actually. Um, that's, it's like one very long data visualization. Um, it's a, a timeline of um, like black history in the United States. Um, it was loading a little slow when I, I pulled up everything before I logged on. Um, so I'm not gonna try and, um, and pull it up. I'm afraid it'll make my computer crash. Um, but what I wanted to really point out is how they're able to make some events on the timeline like really stand out um, in, in just really, really small ways. Um, the whole thing is really, it's just a lot of text and a lot of images, but they're able to like guide you through as, as, a, as a user um, and point your attention to certain things and get you to interact with it how they want you to um, by like, you know, pulling your attention where they, where they need it to be um, and to get you to look. Um, so things as simple as, you know, making things the, the same color that the, the photo is toned or including images for certain events, um, making things like nice and bold um, so that they're easy to read. So, okay. All right, so we're gonna get into the next section. I'm uh, talking about how to use data ethically and not mislead with data. So I wanna start with talking um, about um, what, why is it that we create data visualization in the first place? Um, like not just why uh, data viz and data visualization are effective, um, like why do we do it in the first place? I mean, that helps us understand why it is, it's so important to not mislead and to not deceive with what we do. Um, the whole point of making data visualization in the first place is to try and make it easier for people to understand information that we're putting out there. Sometimes when we write, um, it can be a lot to take in, especially if something is very long or if it's very complex ideas. Um, it, making something that is visual can make it so much easier to understand. Um, it, you can condense information into like more manageable pieces, like some of the, the viz that we've seen already, like the, the one about the, the schools and the kids with, you know, failing test scores. And then, um, you know, the interactive uh, map of, um, you know, the share of people living in extreme poverty. Um, it helps people understand in a way that they couldn't before. But with that comes a lot of responsibility. Okay. Um, okay, so as we get into this, I want to talk first about um, quantitative versus qualitative and the difference between the two. Um, so you can have in, in data visualization in whether it's interactive, whether it's um, uh, whether it's just a static infographic, you can have both qualitative and quantitative um, content. So qualitative is talking about the numbers, um, the data, anything that you can measure. Um, so that can be like a graph, it can be like statistics, it can be, you know, um, some sort of map. Um, when we start talking about qualitative information, we start talking about information that can't necessarily be measured. Um, so you start talking about things that are representing um, ideas, concepts. Um, and if you think about it, a lot of data viz and graphics that you encounter it's like this marriage of both of those things, qualitative and quantitative. Um, so where it becomes easy to um, mislead with data is where those, the intersection of those two things. Um, and when you're trying to translate, you know, qualitative and quantitative into visual. Um, so sometimes, um, I guess the easiest way to say it is things can kind of get lost in translation. And our job as journalists, our job as the as you know, data visualists is to try and make sure that things don't get lost in translation, and you know that the information, it, it, the, the integrity of the information um, is kept intact. Okay, so because ultimately it's not the the thing that we create that is doing the lying; it's um, the people who make them. Okay, so I want to show you some examples of what do we mean when we say, you know, misleading or even lying with data. Um, so one of those things is hiding relevant data or hiding like relevant information 
when it benefits us. Um, so this is an example of, um, you know, a fake company saying, you know, our sales have improved by 12% over last year. Okay. Well, when you look at the actual data that they're talking about, that's technically true, but not actually true. So they really went from negative 15 to 70% in sales um, over that um, year period. Um, the average in their sales was 12%, which is not the same thing as saying your sales have improved 12%. The average is like your baseline or your, not your baseline, um, your average is like, you know, you're steady, like about how you were doing, you know, across that, you know, period of time. That's not improvement. That's like you're, you're steady. Um, so, well, technically, yeah, 12% is true. It's also not really true. Okay. And then this is like a, a conceptual version of a type of map that we'll talk about later. Um, this is a symbol map that somebody tried to put together of um, the US. So you can kind of see the outline of the United States. There's like Florida and Texas, Maine, um, what's supposed to be Hawaii and Alaska. Um, this is supposed to be of people below the poverty line in the US. And technically it's kind of true. Um, most people who are below the poverty line are in you know, some of the Southern states. And then there's like another pocket in you know, the Midwest. But even though this is still like a conceptual thing, I mean, even if it did have real data associated with it, like symbol maps, symbol maps are created when your data point is, um, it correlates to the size of the circle. This would still be extremely hard to read um, and it wouldn't tell you a whole lot. So a better way to do this would be something like this. Like this is a lot easier to read and it's a lot more accurate. It's a lot more truthful um, as opposed to all of those, those circles. Um, so this actually gives you some context because it shows you like the actual size of the states. It shows you like, it uses color, it uses the shading to show you, you know, darker shade for, you know, worst level of poverty as opposed to like these circles that, you know, random sizes that don't really mean anything. Um, to us. And you can see, yeah, in the south southeast, that is where some of the worst concentration is. Um, and you, then you've also got some some issues over here in the in the central part of the country. Um, you can kind of see that from this last um, this conceptual view, but this is of course a lot better. Okay. And then this is something that we'll talk about um, uh, a little bit later, um, but uh, looking at uh, proportion um, and looking at perspective at when we're talking about creating our data visualization. So this is um, based off of uh, really election propaganda from a Venezuelan election um, uh, back in 2013. So this guy, Maduro, he actually won um, against this guy, Caprias. Um, the, the vote was about 51% to 49%. And the reason these look so wonky is because the perspective is like, you're looking down on the graph. You're looking down on the bars of the chart and they're these like so cylinder things. I mean, it, this is not what you would think of when you think of a chart like this. Like this is what it should actually look like. That's how close the vote actually was. But this guy Maduro in this propaganda was saying, oh, you know, I did so much better. I, you know, I like, you know, crushed this other guy. But no, this is really how close the vote was. Like, you know, if you round 51% to 49% is very, very close. And then there's an example that I want to show you. Um, it's probably one of the worst that I've seen um, in the past few years. Um, so this is much more recent. Um, if you're not familiar, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom 
um, run out of New York, but they cover issues all over the country. Um, and they have this program, um, local, uh, local reporting network, um, where they pair up with, you know, other, um, newsrooms across the country and like, uh, team up on stories. So they actually did the story with the Sacramento Bee, which is here in California on talking about homicides and county jails. And this is one of the main chart from the story. And I'm going to read you the excerpt that they have as like their main kind of um, their main takeaway from the story. It says some California county jails saw their rate of inmate on inmate homicides triple or quadruple and statewide the number rose 46 percent after 2011 prison reforms shifted responsibility from state prisons to county lockups. Okay, so that sounds terrible, right? You know, you know, triple, quadruple, you know, the statewide number rose 46%. That's like almost more than half. I mean, that, that sounds absolutely awful. I'm sorry if my screen is moving here. I'm having trouble. Keep it, it's moving around my, my window here. Um, so that sounds absolutely terrible. So what they don't tell you, and what I'll point out in a second, is that the 46% is really comprised of some very small numbers. Um, so the reason that you're seeing triple and quadruple, even though that sounds really bad, you're looking at relatively small numbers. So you see right here, you've got two to six, that's your triple. So two times three is six, that's your triple. And then here where you've got zero to four, that's your quadruple. And then these numbers, th these are your totals, these numbers in your bar. So those are your, um, your very, very small population um, that we're talking about. If you add all of these up, these numbers, they don't even add up to 50. So it's a very small population, very small data set, data, um, set, data set that you're working with. So while what they're saying is true, it's not necessarily ethical. It's not necessarily um, on the up and up. It's, it's misleading. So if you look at their title, it says there has been an explosion of homicides in California's county jails. And then it's asking, you know, here's why. So when you hear explosion, you think, oh my gosh, that's terrible. That's just, you know, that sounds, you know, it, it sounds, you know, very urgent, very, you know, um, something needs to be done immediately. Like the, there needs to be action. But when you start reading and pulling back the layers a little bit, it's kind of like, wait a second, this, this is very exaggerated. This is very, you know, this is not nearly as bad as you said it was. So how do you present data and make data viz that doesn't mislead? Or really like that last example, it's almost, it's, it's more like lying. So how do you do better than that? So to approach data viz ethically, I've boiled it down to like three different steps. So the first thing is you wanna analyze the need. So analyze the data and the information that you have at hand. So take a step back and ask yourself, will the vi visualization that you create help your audience understand your data better or understand some sort, some information that you're trying to convey better? Are you trying to tell a story or are you trying to just, you know, make statistics pr pretty? Um, if you determine that you have like a real need for this visualization, then go for it. If not, then you probably need to reassess. So you want to identify the objective for the visualization. So determine what you want the audience to know and to do with the infographic or the visualization. Like, what do you want them to know? What do you want them to take away from it? Like, what action do you want them to take? How do you want them to respond?
Sorry, one side up. My window went away. I have to stop sharing for a second. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened. Google Slides kicked me out. Okay. Can everybody see? Did it come back? Yes, we can see now. Okay, thank you. All right, sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. Okay, so the last step um, th that you really need to um, focus on is choosing the right visualization for your data and for the content for your information. Um, so certain infographic and um, like charts, certain maps were designed for very specific types of data and for specific types of information. Um, so like, for example, a flow chart is a really effective way to um, show a process. So, you know, you start with one bubble and, you know, you have two options. It's like, you know, do you go this way? Do you go this way? Or you have, you know, you start here, you go to the next step, to the next step, to the next step, to the next step. Um, if you're trying to show uh, data or information over time, uh, a line graph is definitely the way to go uh, because you're trying to show um, something longitudinal. Um, if you're trying to represent or compare amounts of something, then a bar chart or, or, or um, sometimes it's called a column graph or a column chart is what you would want to use. And there are way more chart types than I than most people uh, understand there are. Um, so I included in some resources uh, that I, I shared with um, your facilitators um, some uh, handouts on um, chart types. Um, so it's also accessible through this link and the slides, but I'm actually going to go to that folder and pull them up. So one is called chart suggestions PDF. And the other one is called chart infographic. So I'm gonna pull up one. Um, so the first one, and I'm sorry, you can hear my dog whining. She's still itching to get in. Um, so the first one here, it actually color codes uh, the different um, uh, categories of charts. So you've got comparison, distribution, composition, and relationship. Um, and you start in the middle, it asks you, you know, what would you like to show? You pick whatever one of those things it is you're trying to, to show, and you go from there, um, it, it, figuring out, you know, what type of data do you have? Um, uh, to, and, you know, moving through this flowchart to get to the, um, the thing that is, um, that fits your data the best. Okay, so that's the first one. And then this other one, um, very similar to the other one, also color coded, but I included this one as well because it gives definitions for each one of those things. So distribution, relationship, composition, and comparison. Okay. And then I did include this link to something that's just a little fun. Um, it's called viz.wtf. Um, and it's where I actually took some um, examples for um, part of the next um, part of the presentation. Um, it's people who took screenshots of really bad examples of data viz from outlets all over the world. Um, stuff that just doesn't make sense at all. Um, it's just, they're, you know, charts that don't add up to a hundred and varying other things. So it's entertaining to me to, 
you know, see how far I've come in terms of data viz. So I, I thought it might be something fun for you all to look at as well. So, all right. I'm sorry for the howling. <laughs> okay. So there are a couple of other things that I want to go over in terms of best practices. So when you're trying to design your data visualizations, you want to design for visual efficiency is what we call it. So you want to include only the parts that are most necessary. So this is example is an infographic trying to explain the really complex um, concept um, of something I'd never heard of, um, but it's called a Zetabyte. Um, it's, you know, it's a bigger version of storage, uh, computer storage um, uh, designation. Um, you know, you have megabytes on your computer, a um, thousand megabytes is a gigabyte. And then a thousand gigabytes is a terabyte. Well, apparently it goes up and up and up until you get to a zettabyte. Um, and it's very hard um, to sort of conceptualize. Um, so I like this because it shows that, you know, one flows into the other, flows into the other. Um, in this, in the article um, that this infographic is in, it, it gives this much longer explanation saying, you know, um, these different pieces, you know, you can stream the entire Netflix catalog more than 3000 times. And, you know, Zetabyte is a thousand exabytes and it's equivalent to 250 billion DVDs. Well, that's great. It helps you understand the scale. Um, like you can see, you know, one exabyte to one Zetabyte, like it helps you understand that better. Um, but, you know, in this case, the, the data viz itself is um, very streamlined, very simple, and very easy to understand. Okay. okay. So still designing for efficiency. One thing that we saw earlier with that um, Venezuelan election propaganda was um, those that column chart where it was kind of looking down on the perspective um, and it seemed very distorted. Um, well, 2D, 3D graphics inherently are going to have um, a, a level of distortion to them because of how they, your eye is going to perceive depth um, trying to show something that's 3D on a 2D plane. Um, so if you look at this example here on the left, you know, you've got this weird kind of like corner thing that your eye is seeing because it looks like it's on this 3D plane. You've got, you know, these cylinders that have got shadow. Uh, I did notice when I was, I picked out this example, that the scale is also in decimals instead of percentages, which was also something that's odd because the percentages are on the columns. And I remade this chart to show you exactly, this is what it should look like. Um, and if you look carefully, it seems like, you know, here 15 and 25% are, a little bit more distorted than they are here. Um, like here, it looks like they're, you know, um, a little bit closer than they, uh, close, close, they're in more in proximity uh, like they should be since they're only 10% apart. Here, it looks like they're, they're much further apart because you've got this whole like, you know, block thing going on in this plane. So a uh, very important to stick to two dimensions. I haven't, in 10 years of doing this, I haven't found yet a reason to make a three-dimensional graphic, so. Okay. And then you also wanna design for accessibility. So here we've got um, these two maps showing the US population. Um, so on the one side, we've got what we call a uh, continuous scale. So it's that gradient. So you're able to um, basically show the, the minimum number and the maximum number as the lighter color all the way to a darker color. And all the other numbers kind of fall into place in between those colors. Um, so the bad part about that is you can't really compare elements that fall in the same range. So if something is the exact same in, in this kind of the same bucket, you can't really make that distinction. Um, like you can with the one on the right. So this is called a discrete scale. So it basically creates like these buckets, these like categories or, um, or um, ranges um, where you can really see the differences between 
um, things that are um, more alike and things that are, are, are more different. Um, so the difference between that continuous and the discrete scales is that with the discrete, you can make buckets that are different sizes. The continuous scale, everything's kind of the same size. So here you've got, you know, US population, some states have millions of people, um, some literally only have thousands. I mean, California, Texas, huge states um, with millions of people. So you see on the end here where there are much darker shades, you go from, you know, 20 million to 37.3 million. So you're talking about like 17 million in just this one color. Um, whereas here, where you, at the beginning of the still scale, you go from like 500,000 to a million. So you're only talking about 500,000. So you're able to cater those um, and tailor those buckets to like the changing size uh, of, of, the of, the, of the data. You're able to customize it so that you're able to see those trends and see those patterns a little bit better. Um, So one of the things that I also want to point out when you're talking about um, designing for accessibility is not just um, des thinking about, you know, being able to notice these comparisons really well. One of the reasons that this works so well is because of the contrast between the colors. Um, you have to think really, um, really consciously about people with visual impairments um, and thinking about being um, colorblind friendly. And one of the things that I'll show you when we get to Data Wrapper is there's a built-in tool for a colorblind check, um, which I really, really like. Um, and I think more programs should have that. Um, the other thing that you wanna make sure you do is label everything properly. You wanna make sure that everything is very easy to see, everything is very accessible, that everything is very easy to understand. Like it's easy to see that, you know, this box goes to this, this goes to this. You wanna make sure that, you know, when you look at it, it doesn't take a lot of work to figure out what it is you're looking at. Okay. And then this one actually came from that viz.wtf. Um, you wanna minimize distractions when you're talking about visual efficiency. This one in particular is pretty egregious. It's how far can you go with one barrel of oil? I mean, it's missing like the, the O, one barrel oil. I mean, it's talking about, um, you know, these different modes of transportation and how far can you go. Um, ironically, the modes of transportation where you can go, um, you can't go the, where you can go the, the, the least amount of distance, those are the biggest. So the, the jet liner where you can go one kilometer is the biggest. And you know, the, the kind of like little auto car over here that can go a thousand to 1300 kilometers is like one of the smallest. Um, the thing over here that's 1800 kilometers that I couldn't even tell what it was because uh, it's so, these icons are so like, um, they're not realistic enough to really tell completely what they are at, at first glance. Um, it's the tiniest. Um, at first, I, it took me a couple tries to finally figure out that this was a boat, a motorboat of some sort, and not like a car on water. Um, but yeah, it's also, you know, an example of, you know, you've got, you know, very distracting type, you've got, you know, icons and things competing for each other. Um, it's just, it's set up very, very poorly. And it, the information is getting lost in the fact that it's presented so badly. And that's definitely not what you want. Okay. So any questions before we go on to mapping data? Okay, we'll keep going. Okay, so Data Wrapper has three different types of maps that we're gonna. Um, um, hello, Dana. There's a oh, question. Okay. okay, great. Go ahead. Just a second. Sure, no problem.
Okay. Um, thank you, Donna. The session has been okay so far, but I got lost somewhere where there was a zettabyte and exabyte. I really, really got lost. Uh, elaborate oh. some more about it, maybe. Sure, no problem. Let me go back. Okay. Uh, Donna, there's another question. Sure. Um, let me let me go back to this one, and I'll take that person. Okay. So um, to answer your question about the um, the exabyte zettabyte, what I was just trying to um, convey was that um, even though there was a ton of information in the story itself to try and explain this um, concept that's a little abstract, that that's a little tough to understand, um, that you know we're talking about something that's so huge that has all the storage in it. Um, it does, the graphic itself does a really good job of just streamlining and kind of cutting out all that extra. Like this is all the stuff over here on the left, all of that extra stuff that was in the story. The graphic doesn't include any of that. It's just very simple, like, you know, a thousand of these equals one of these, you know, and so on and so forth until you get all the way down to the zeta byte. So I was just trying to make the point that, you know, don't include all, don't try and include everything in the graphic. Um, just include what you need to include because um, it's not the, the graphic doesn't have to carry everything. Um, in most cases, your data viz is going to accompany some sort of um, new story or news report, unless you're doing, um, you know, just an infographic to, you know, uh, be your entire thing, in which case you have to think about it a little bit differently. You have to strategize a little bit differently. Um, but even still, you want to, you know, just include um, what is going to be helpful um, to your to your reader and to your your um, who's going to consume your information. You don't want to overload them with so much that it's, you know, they're trying to, you know, kind of hack their way through it to, to understand it. So it's just a matter of just paring down to just the basics is what I was trying to get at. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, we have another question. Sure, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Donna, for the presentation. My question is, um, journalism usually we love using big words. For example, we might say instead of a blast, it is an explosion. So when you presenting the graphics, you're telling us that uh, we should stay away from like, right there you've put 2D or those that show a little bit of perspective and then it distorts the information. So is it, is it uh, is, is, is graphic presentation a little bit different from the usual journalism whereby you're trying to show impact, you use a big word to show like instead of um, uh, score, people who've been killed, you can call it a bloodshed. So for, for graphic presentation, is it strictly that it has to remain as simple or as basic as possible? Just like you're saying, you're not using 2D graphics. So is that the case for graphics that for it, the information has to be just simple, plain and basic instead of creating an impression that this was something big, something huge happened? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you wanna keep it simple. Yeah, you wanna make sure that there's no distortion, there's no um, there's no room for interpreting it in a way that is more verbose. There's no way to interpret as, as more exaggerated. That's why you want to keep it like very simple, straightforward, and basic, like you said. Um, like, yeah, we do tend to use big words in, in journalism and sometimes, you know, be very flashy and very like, you know, we want to be, you know, a little flowery and, you know, kind of extra with our language, but um, and the data viz, you don't want to give the impression that you're kind of like editorializing. You want to stick to what is literally, what is the data? Like, and just, you know, don't get in the way of what the numbers are and what the data is. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's all for now. I think we can continue. Okay. okay.
All right, so the first type of map that we're gonna uh, talk about in Data Wrapper is a choropleth map. And this is the one we're actually gonna be making together. Um, so it is actually, it's also the one that we saw in the example when we were talking about misleading with data. The one where I, sh I showed you um, the poverty levels by different state. Um, so basically you are showing differences. You're making comparisons by using color. You're using a darker color for a bigger number and a lighter color for uh, a smaller number. That's the that's the um, the accepted way to do it. People flip them sometimes, but that is that is the wrong way to do it. Um, and data wrapper that that type of chart it's responsive, which means it'll look good on a phone. Um, it can be interactive um, with like tooltips, and it can also like zoom in. Okay, the second type of map is a symbol map. So this is that one that someone was trying to make that weird conceptual thing that I showed you also for the poverty levels in the US. This is what one done appropriately is supposed to look like. So you actually create um, symbols. Um, in this case, they're using circles um, and they're sized according to what the data is. So bigger is um, usually a bigger amount, smaller is smaller amount. And in this case, they also added color as a, as a category um, for talking about different types of things as well. Um, and again, this symbol map, same as the core cleft map, looks good on a phone, interactive, tooltips, and can zoom. And then um, the last type of map is a locator map. So basically, it's um, just showing you a location. Uh, but I like this because sometimes you just need something that's really quick, simple. This is really great for that. You just need to show where something is. Um, it's responsive, so it'll look good on a phone, but it's static. It's it's not interactive at all. Um, but I do like it because it's got, it taps into like satellite imagery. Um, so things like um, the same kind of, of programming that um, things like, you know, Google Maps um, and, that kind of, and that kind of thing is going to um use like satellite imagery so you do get like building details and that sort of thing so it doesn't just look like okay it's a flat swath of land um, and there's nothing here it's just land and water um, it actually will show you more like geographic details and get pretty specific um, and i like that it will add it's got lots of labels it's got it can get pretty specific for you and make it look really nice so okay so we're going to do some hands-on work together um, so as I understand it, everybody has made a data wrapper account um, uh, before this session. So we're actually going to go to data wrapper and start making some things. So if you will go to that web address and open up data wrapper, um, and then I'm going to go to the folder um, that you all have access to, um, and I'm going to open up the uh, some data. So I'm going to open up Data Wrapper, and we're going to go to Create New, and you're going to go Create New Map. What you see here is my library of stuff I've already done, and you're going to want to say you're going to create a core pleth map. That's what you're going to want to start with. And you should land on a screen like this. If you don't, it means that you're not logged in or something went wrong. Okay. okay. So in case anybody needs a, a chance to catch up for a second, I'm going to go over to our data and show you what that's all about. So let me go back to our slides for a second. And I'm going to tell you about uh, the data that we're going to be using. So we are going to be using uh, crime statistics um, by, for uh, districts um, from 2020 from the Uganda police. And this is where I got the data from. It's a report from the Uganda police um, that they put out each year. Uh, it was downloaded from this African Center for Media Excellence, um, which is where I got one of the, um, I think it's where I got one of the other infographics that I used as an example earlier. Um, but you can see, you know, they update the data pretty regularly. Um, 
and I just downloaded all the data as a spreadsheet. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through how I got all this data cleaned up um, so that you don't have to. You're going to um, just work with the cleaned up version. So basically what I did is I downloaded it and I'm going to walk you through how I cleaned it up. So all you have to do is copy and paste what I tell you to into data wrapper. So then we can do the fun part together and you don't have to worry about this part. So this is what it looked like when I downloaded it um, from uh, from the as the crime statistics from that report. So it gave me regions and districts um, and I all I did was add bold to all the ones that were capitalized. I assume that all the ones that were capitalized are the regions and then everything that was um, not capitalized were, were districts. And when I started looking them up, that seemed to be true. So I just went with that. Okay. And then I have total cases, I have homicides. Um, and then it, and it got a little strange because there's no key. It doesn't tell me what these different categories are. So I am somewhat guessing um, if I was able to, I would have um, done a little bit more digging and contacted the Uganda police for a key as to what all of these categories specifically mean. Um, but I haven't been able to find that information. Um, and unfortunately, I'm a, at a disadvantage being in a different time zone in a different country. Um, but from what I can figure out, I've got homicides, some sort of economic crime, I'm guessing these are some sort of like sexual assault against adults and against children. Um, break in, breakings, I'm guessing is maybe like break-ins. Um, thefts, it seems self-explanatory. Robberies, assaults. I don't know what other crimes is. We've got terrorism, um, politics and media is what I'm guessing that is. Corruption, um, narcotics. And then I have no idea what other laws is. So what I did is we're, we're pretty much just gonna use total cases here. Um, all right, so what I did first is I created a tab um, called comparison, okay? Or, I'm sorry, oops, no, wrong one. I'm sorry, the first thing I did is I created one called data wrapper districts. So what I did is I went into data wrapper, I'm gonna have to go back and forth a little bit here. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna type in Uganda. And you see it's got some maps, some base layers already in here for Uganda. So these are all the map layers that Data Wrapper already has in here for Uganda. So there is an option here where you can upload your own map. And there's a little note that tells you, you know, you can upload your own map by selecting these types of file size, blah, blah, blah. Um, we're, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna utilize the ones that it already has. So you're gonna select the one that says Uganda, districts 2021 and when you click on it you get uganda districts and hopefully the, that should look familiar and you're going to click proceed and then you're going to get this dashboard so you're going to have like this little map preview up in the left hand corner and then over here on the right you're going to have what looks kind of like a spreadsheet um, and it's gonna have all of these district names in it. So you've got this name column and you've got the values column. So it's got this on the first row here, it's called D. And then on this other one, it's called value, okay? And I have no idea why it assigned it that way, but you know, I'm guessing D is for district. And then this is for the value of the data that we're gonna put in. So what I did is I copied the names of all of these districts, like all the way down, it says there are 136. And let me go back to our data here. So I copied all of these into my spreadsheet here so that I could see what all of them are, my data wrapper districts. Okay. And then I did something called a V lookup. Okay. And it means a vertical lookup. And since I had some requests for this in the other sessions that I've done, I included an, a tip sheet, uh, like a, some a tutorial links on how to do a VLOOKUP in the materials that you're gonna get after this session. Um, it's a formula that's, that exists in Excel and in Google Sheets. Um, it's a little complex um, to explain in like 10 minutes, 
Um, so I'm just going to show you what I did. And if you want to learn more, you can go through that tutorial to try and understand. So basically what this does is it compares this list of districts to this list of districts, this regions and districts that I have here. Okay. So I just made a, this VLOOKUP tab is just a copy of this. Okay. We're going to leave comparison alone. I think that was my other calculations. Okay. So what I did where you see all this in a business, um, I created a column called data wrapper, and this is where I'm doing that VLOOKUP formula. So this is the actual formula. And I won't get into what all of this means, but basically what I'm doing is I'm looking to see if this exists in that data wrapper um, list. And if it doesn't, it gives me this hashtag NA is saying that it gives me this error. It says, did not find value. And then it lists what it is in VLOOK of evaluation. It's basically telling me it can't find it because it's not in that list. And then if it does find it, then it just prints out what it is. It just writes it out for me, okay? And it does that all the way down my list, okay? All right, so why is that important? So then what I did is I created, I duplicated this tab, and then I came over here and I created something called sorted. And you see all my NAs are gone. So what I did is I filtered out all those NAs. So this is a filter. And you see, I've got my NA over here. So if I check that off, they all come back. And the reason that I don't want the NAs there is because there's no district for those in data wrapper. If they aren't on this list, I don't have a place for the data to show up on the map. And we only want to put data into data wrapper that's actually going to show up on the map. Otherwise, it's just going to be a bunch of extra junk that we don't need. And I will tell you that as we get a couple more steps in, we're still going to have some extra junk, but it won't be as much. Okay, so I'm going to clear out those NAs again. I'm going to un unselect that one. Okay, and then we're going to go. Okay, so you see it's gotten rid of that. And then in my clean sheet here, what I've got here is just my data wrapper column. with my districts, all my districts match my data wrapper all the way down, okay? And then what I did is I copied that into new data. I copied my districts that I have from data wrapper, my data wrapper list, and then I just copied the list of total cases or the, I'm sorry, the column of total cases that go with my data wrapper columns. So what we're gonna do is you're gonna copy this um, information from new data. So Gerald, can you put the, the link to this tab in the chat? Or actually I can do it. I forgot um, if I can get backwards. Or actually, can you do it? I'm having trouble going backwards. And I'll wait a second for folks to catch up. While that's happening, I'm going to go ahead and select all of this. I'm just going to highlight it all the way down. Okay. And I'm going to go up to edit and I'm going to do copy. You can also do, you know, the short key, cut keys on your, on your keyboard. Um, if you're on a Mac, it's command C. And then I'm gonna go back over to data wrapper and where it says copy and paste your data. And it's very important where it says, including your header row and your column. So we've got that district and total cases that's in there. And it doesn't matter that this filter is on. I'm just gonna go ahead and paste that. So I'm gonna right click and then paste. And I've got all my data in there. So now it's going to do some magic. Okay, it says successfully pasted your data in. 
And you notice I've got stuff in there now. But we've also got some, some strange things happening. And let me explain what's, what those things are. So I've got more districts here than I actually had information from, um, from the report. And that's something I haven't quite been able to reconcile, like why this one has more in different districts than the, one, the information I got from the Uganda police. I'm, even though I lived in Uganda for a short time, I'm not familiar enough with the geography to understand why exactly that is. Um, but anyway, so the ones that are grayed out down here, these are the ones that it's talking about that are 31 unused. And if you look up here in the map preview, those are the ones that are gray. Those are the ones that it's saying, I don't have any information for. And those are the ones from the, from the data that we have, we don't have any information for. Those came back as NA because they didn't match. And then we have this one thing called error here. And it's saying, okay, so you brought in information, but I don't have a district that matches this. So if we click on this little drop down here, it's gonna try and suggest like, okay, what district do you actually mean by that? And if we scroll down, kind of look here, if you look, you see, okay, uh, and I'm going to butcher the name of this, uh, Simbabwe. I'm going to take my best stab at it. Um, it looks like that is our best match. And the reason that it's giving us an error is because it's missing an S. It's S-S-E-M, and this is only S-E-M. So the data that came from the Uganda police is spelled incorrectly compared to data wrapper. So if I click on the one in data wrapper that has the two S's, it gets rid of the error. And now it has the little check mark, check mark. Okay, so now we fixed our errors. So I'm gonna click proceed. And it's just, it's just going through the tabs now. So it's telling me here, match the data with your map. So what it's doing is it's saying the matching key is this name column and that's the district. So it's matching the districts and data wrapper um, in, to the, the district column that we pasted in. And we know that because we did that intentionally. That's what we were, we were matching on when we were comparing in the, in the data set. And then select the column for name, that's the district that we've got here from our data set. And then the column for values is total cases that we've got here. Okay, I'm gonna click proceed. And see, this is giving us the same information that we already have. So you, it's saying that numbers are blue, and we can see that. Dates are green. We don't have any dates, so there's no green. Text is black, and we know that. Um, cells marked with the dash contain no data. Well, we, can, we see that because those are unused. And then the red indicates missing data or a problem, and we resolved that problem, the error that was here. So we're going to proceed with that. And now it's going to take us to actually do some refining and some styling to our map. And I don't know why mine is sizing in and out like that. Okay, stop. All right, so the first thing that we see here is it's trying to figure out where the colors are coming from. And our values is our total cases, so that's where we want it to come from, so that's all good. And then we can select our color palette. And when we, and every, uh, color palette in data wrapper is colorblind friendly, um, like I was refer like I was alluding to earlier. So if I I can pick any one in here, um, and if I go down to this little uh, tool in the corner, it's called a colorblind check. So if you mouse over any of these um, little boxes down here, it tells you um, these are different types of visual impairment, um, different types of colorblindness or different, um, I guess, uh, kinds of colorblindness. Um, and on one end is normal vision, and then on the other end is complete colorblindness. And if there's a problem, it gives you a, you know, kind of a, a, a triangle, like warning sign, like they're okay, there's something, there's something wrong here. Um, that the contract, basically what it's telling you with that little caution triangle is that the contrast isn't isn't great enough for someone with this type of colorblindness to be able to um, be able to really uh, understand what they're looking at. 
So this would not be a good one to choose. This would not be a good palette. So instead we should probably choose something else. So I'm gonna go back to just the default one that's there. Actually, no, that's actually a bad one. So we're gonna pick something else. Oh, well, this seems like a good one. We're gonna go with green. Okay. All right, so now we get to talk about our scale here. All right, so we've got here, we've got, they call it steps and linear. This is the same thing we were talking about earlier. So this is steps is discrete. Those, you know, discrete or, you know, buckets or bins or whatever you want to call them. And then linear is our continuous, okay? So like I said, you can get a little bit more, um, you know, comparison using your steps or um, your discrete. So that's what we're going to use this time. Um, I've used linear um, in some uh, past examples, but um, today I'm feeling like using steps. And I'm going to use five as um, the default. Um, so I'm just going to leave it at that. And the easiest one for, to use is rounded values. What it does is it kind of, you know, guesses for you, um, like where the, the easiest breaks are for you in whole numbers. Yeah. And then if you, if it's kind of too many breaks here for you, and you, you know, um, part of the reason that these are going vertical instead of horizontal is um, uh, there's not enough room for them to be side by side. Um, you can change that in the labeling. You can change it from this ruler to ranges and it'll show up at the top here where it's a little bit easier to read. And then the other thing we can do is we can add a, a caption, a little title for our key. So we can call this total cases. And then we can also change the number format. You notice how none of our numbers up here have a comma. We can also change that. So right now, this one is telling us that it's going to have a decimal. If we go down here, uh, let's see. I think if I, it's just the one with the zero. Yeah, there we go. The one with 10,000 um, with the, the rounded number with the comma is the one that will give you the comma and the whole numbers. Forgot for a second. Okay. There's also some other customization you can do here. You can start your range at um, a specific number. So um, if you wanted to start specifically at the um, absolute minimum number of cases, you could. it tells you what it is in the box, it's 256. And then the highest number is 3,213. You could start there, but I like having the rounded numbers because remember when we were talking about visual cues, it's easier for your mind to process sort of these like natural breaks, like even numbers or numbers that are um, kind of our, our, um, our um, uh, ranges of like, you know, 50, 100, like 20, 40, 60, that sort of thing. It's easier for us to interpret those and to, um, to understand those when we're looking at information. It's a lot under easier to understand understand a scale of like you know 50, 100, 200 than it is of like you know 45, 90, 270. Like it's very disjointed and it's not something that comes naturally. Okay. All right, so we're gonna click proceed. Okay, so now we get to add in some information here. Um, we need a title, we need a description. Um, so for this, we're actually going to go back to our data for a second. We need to figure out what the heck are we going to write about this? Um, we need to figure out kind of like what's our high point here. So we see we've kind of got some, you know, um, we kind of see what the hot spots are for um, total cases. But I want to know specifically where the most cases were committed so we can, you know, kind of highlight that in our title and description. Um, and then we'll get to the other stuff. So I'm going to go over here to uh, where we had our new data. I'm actually going to sort the list from the highest number of cases to the lowest number of cases to get the district that had the most. So I'm going to, so that's the sort Z to A. And that's the 
Kapchorwa district. I'm so sorry if I butchered that. And I actually did a little bit of this beforehand. So I actually wrote a little bit a title beforehand for this. So I said, Kapchorwa district led the country in crimes reported in 2020. And then as a description, I said, there were, oh, and it's not a thousand crimes. There were nearly 3,200 crimes. 3,213, 3,220 crimes, including, and then I listed off some of the things from our data set here. So homicide, thefts, robberies, assaults, that's what I wound up putting in our um, description here. So homicide, theft, robbery, assaults reported in that district last year, according to a re report released by Uconda police. So it kind of puts into context like, okay, this is what you're looking at and this is why. Okay, so who published the data? That would be Uganda police. And this all comes up later when you um, uh, publish the, um, the data. Okay. And I'm gonna take the URL where the report actually lives so that if somebody actually wanted to go and see the data source, they could. And then who created the chart? That would be your name. And then this part is really, in, is really important for accessibility, this alternative description for screen readers. So if you don't know, screen reader is something that you use and people with disabilities, especially visual impairment use to help them um, navigate uh, the internet. Um, it basically, it reads the content to them on web pages when they can't see it. Um, so instead of just, you know, putting a description that's like exactly what the title is, I try and do something that's a little bit more um, descriptive than that. So I'm actually going to steal my description from something else for a second. I'm going to stop sharing for one minute. I pasted it somewhere and I can't find it. Here it is. There we go. Okay. So I am saying that it is a core plus map showing the total crimes by district in Uganda for 2020. And then I'm saying what district I am where that district is um, so that someone who couldn't see this map still gets the information um, that the, the map has in a, in a general way. So I'm telling them what type of map it is, what the map is of, and then kind of what the high point is. The district that has the, had the total number of, of of crimes and then where that district is, which is the Eastern part of the country, um, you know, close to the coast. Okay. Um, and then there's some other uh, cool tools in here. You can add like a little text annotation. So if I wanted to say that, you know, if I wanted to add a little note here, I could um, add something here. Um, if I wanted to say something specific, like about that district, I could do that there. I'm going to delete it. Okay, I'm going to click proceed. Okay, all the layout's good. And now we can get to the point where we can um, publish um, and make our, our map available um, to other people, or we can download the image file. So there are a couple of things that you have to do in order to do that. Um, so the first thing is, um, over here on layout, it's always going to be, um, you know, data wrapper and you can't, it's going to always have the data wrapper logo unless you pay for the, the paid version, which I never have. I don't care that it says data wrapper here in the corner. Um, you have some options so you can tell it if you want people to be able to download the data or they can download, um, the, they can also download an image, um, or they can embed the, the map themselves. 
I turn all of those off. I just allow them to download the data. Um, they can download the data in the form of what you actually put into the map. So it'll download a spreadsheet of the what you copy and pasted into um, Data Wrapper to make the map. And then we go to proceed. And then when you are ready, you can click publish now. Um, and then the other thing you can do, you don't have to click publish now, you can export your visualization as a as an image file. It's just a static image file if you just want to publish it as print. So if you click PNG, you've got some you got some options here. So you can change the width, um, you can change um, the border um, uh, kind of spacing on the um, on the visualization. So you can change like kind of how much how much padding there is from the from the edges. Um, you can include the full header and footer, which is, you know, the you've got the title, the description, the legend and all that. Or you can have just the chart itself. You just want the image of that. It'll take all of that stuff away. Um, you can have a white background or you can make it transparent. And when you're ready, you can just click to download the image. So. All right. So I have reached the end of where I wanted to be with this. Um, does anyone have any questions? We've got about 15 minutes for questions. Um, it's the longest I've ever had for questions. So uh, if you all have anything to ask, uh, feel free um, about uh, data wrapper, about any concepts that I've gone over. If there's anything additional that you are wondering about data wrapper, I'm happy to answer those. It does have some other capabilities. If there's questions about that, I'm happy to answer those as well. Yes, Dana, there's a question. Okay. so much so far the session is moving on well <laughs> uh but um I'm, I'm inquiring because i've tried to do the map here uh and the map does not specify that uh, this is a homicide case this is a case uh for maybe robbery or stuff like that as it was in the data that we picked so i don't know how best we can add the specific cases and the uh, of course, this gives the general overview in the visualization. So how do we put the specific cases there? Oh, OK. So if you wanted in the tooltip, say, like, you would have the total cases and then some specific types of crimes? Is that what you're saying? That's what I actually wanted. Eh? <laughs> oh, wait. OK, OK. So you want, um, okay, so you want specific types of crimes for the overall map. So you want like an all homicide map or an all like robbery map or something like that? Okay. Yeah, that's it. That's what we want. That's what you want? Okay, no problem. You got it. All right, that's very easy to accommodate. So I'm gonna go up here to create new. I'm gonna create a new map. I'm going to create another chloroplast map. Okay, again, I'm going to search for Uganda 2021. Proceed. Okay, now I'm going to go back to the data that I have and I'm gonna go back to um, my original here. Uh, it's gonna be a little messy. I have no idea how this is gonna come out because I've not tried it for uh, just off of this sheet unclean, but we're gonna do a little experiment. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna highlight um, column A and then you wanna try homicide. Will that work?
Yes. Homicide. Okay. All right. Um, do you want anything else on there or you just want homicide? Do you want anything else in the info window? We can color the map by homicide, but have other information in the tooltip. So that when we click on a district, it still shows us the various crimes, like in a map. Okay, so you want to. Okay, so when you click on a district, it shows you the various crimes in the tooltip, but you want to see the overall number as the as the shading. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Not a problem. All right. So I'm going to create another tab over here. We're gonna call this um, uh, more data more, or tooltip, more extra data. And tooltips. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna collect this. I'm gonna take the total cases, homicides. I'll take thefts, robberies, assaults, because those are all the ones that I actually know what they are. Um, and I'm going to put that over here. And I don't know what this is going to look like, but we're going to give it a shot. So then I'm going to take all of this highlighted. All right. So I'm going to take everything but the grand total. Come back to data wrapper. I'm going to copy and paste that in. Yeah, it's very mad because I've got lots of things that are uh, not in use. Let's see, it's gonna be headquarters. Okay, I'm gonna have to do some cleanup here. I have to do deleting a lot of stuff. Actually, there's a better way to do this. If I do from the cleaned row. We do regions and districts here. And I know I'm going really fast, but it's just because I know we don't have a lot of time left. Okay, this should work. Okay, yes. All right, so now we only have one error. Where are you? That same weird error we had before. Let's just send it there. Proceed. 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 Okay, so we're gonna go through the same steps that we did before. So I'm gonna turn this into steps and turn it into rounded values and turn it into ranges. I'm gonna say uh, total, total crimes, switch this over to comma. And then we're gonna have an extra step here. So this is gonna give you guys what you want. Um, so we're gonna customize our tooltip. So the map itself is showing um, the total, it, it's colored with the total number of crimes. So what we can do is we can give some formatting to this. So we can say total crimes. And now you see how it, I added by adding that word before it, I've now got, it says total and then the number. So it's a little bit, it's almost like it's kind of coding. So I'm just gonna say total crimes. I'm gonna put it in caps so it's a little easier to read. Okay. And then underneath this, I'm gonna start adding stuff. So I'm gonna add homicides. 
I'm going to add thefts, I'm going to add robberies, and I'm going to add assaults. Add assaults, and I'm adding, putting all of these on different lines. So I'm adding assaults, adding robberies, adding thefts, and homicides. So now if I go back over here, actually I've got a little code in here. And we did not. It's not giving me any line breaks. Well, it's got all the information in there. It's just not formatted very pretty. But you see now it's got total crimes, it's got assaults, robberies, thefts, and homicides. Is that what you all were looking for? Yeah, that's, that's, that's it. That's it? All right. Okay, cool. All right. Nice. All right. I'm glad I got what you were looking for. Hi. Um, okay. Thanks, Donna, for the presentation. Uh, my name is Henry. Hi. Um, initially, I thought this this was quite uh, difficult and stuff for uh, statisticians, but having reflected on it, I think it, it's a really powerful tool for especially explaining difficult, huge amount of. Uh, or compressing huge amount of, amount of data into something small. I, I request that perhaps you recommend to us um, a tutorial or you could record for us a tutorial to uh, kind of deepen our understanding of uh, data wrapper. Um, secondly, I don't know if uh, the interactivity can be exported to platforms like Twitter and uh, Facebook so that you know oh. you can have a presentation of some of this uh, information in those platforms. Thank you very much. Oh, sure. Okay. Okay. So first thing, I've got a list of tutorials already for you in the folder of materials that you all have access to after this. Um, so I broke it down even by maps and then charts and tables that I didn't go over with you um, so that you're able to, um, if you want to go back over things that we did talk about, like with the core plus maps or how to make the other two types of maps that we didn't talk about or how to make any of the chart types, you can do that to go farther with data wrapper. Okay. And these are all like, these are all like um, uh, videos or like walkthroughs. And they all have um, like screenshots or it's a video, um, which I hope is really helpful. Um, and then in terms of uh, social and interactivity, if you go through and actually publish, I'm just going to publish this for the heck of it for a second. It will actually work online if you share it on like Twitter or something. So if you want to share this, you can pick the for sharing link. Um, so it'll compress it so that it's good for like Facebook, Twitter. Um, and it will, it'll show you like the preview version when you're on, you know, Twitter or Facebook, but when you actually link to it, This is what you'll, you'll actually get to play with it online. Like you'll actually get the interactive version. Does, does that make sense? Okay. I didn't. Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. I didn't actually finish filling it out. So that's why it's of course blank. But yeah, if you finish filling it out and then publish it, um, you're able to do that. And then. I didn't show this before, but you can unpublish something too. 
if you decide you you're not ready for it or you don't want it published, you can just unpublish it. But if you've posted it online or anywhere else, it'll take it will stop working in those places. So just be wary of that. So any other questions? All right, we have another question. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Diana. Thank you for the presentation. My name is Magara Darius. Okay. Um, we're inquiring about what you think about our figures of crime. Unfortunately, I don't have some other country or maybe data for 2021 to, for, for you to compare, but generally, what do you think about this crime? Our crime, when you look at the figures, is it so bad? Are we fair? I don't know. So what's your comment about the, the, the real death itself and the crime? Um, it's hard for me to say um, because, because I'm not as familiar with the country. Um, I don't know. I mean, I can say when I, uh, I lived in Uganda for a really, really short time in 2011. Um, and I don't know, com I was in uh, Kasubi uh and kind of in and out of Kasubi and Kampala but I mean the numbers to me compared to the population do not seem that bad but um I know a lot of crimes go unreported in a lot of places so or you don't have a way to report it so I mean I kind of take it with a grain of salt I mean these are just the crimes that get reported so I mean a lot of things could have happened that weren't reported so I don't know um I would say based on the data that it doesn't seem quite so terrible, but you have to consider that sometimes it's not just what's in the data, it's also what isn't there. And you have to consider the factors that are around why something isn't there. So in this case, it probably has a lot to do with the fact that there are people who can't report you know, um, certain crimes or they can't get to you know, a, a police officer or something to report a crime, or maybe they're fearful of reporting a crime. I mean, the same, I think that happens in every country, you know, especially with the fear, but also the remoteness of being in a certain area and being able to report a crime. I mean, as more connected as the, the country becomes with telecommunications, I think it becomes easier, but I think it's still difficult in some places. So, all right, um, I think we've reached, uh, well, it's 10 p.m. for me. Hey, I don't know. Uh, we have another question. Oh, one more? Okay, I'll keep going. Okay. Um, Good morning and thanks for the presentation. Good morning. My question is, um, is it possible to save this, this map uh, for the print version of the media, like in a PDF, is that possible? Yes. How can I yes. do it? Yes, so where I was showing you how to export as a PNG, that's what you want for print. You can put that PNG into a PDF or you can save that PNG to your computer and then um, convert it to a PDF. But yes, this, that's the static form of the map um, or of anything that you make on data and data wrapper. You can turn anything on data wrapper into a static image file that you can use for print. <laughs> That's part of why I like it so much. It can be interactive for a web page. Hey, we have another or... question. Yeah, go for it. Um, thank you again for the presentation. Now I have two, two
two, two, two questions. One, um, on the data wrapper, how much room do we have to play with, uh, with the data of the creative? Is it limited because it is online or there is a version that you can purchase and it gives you more room for animation? I do know that we have software programs, I think like Illustrator, Adobe. Uh, should we go with such programs if we wanted to do more with our presentations or even Data Wrapper can give us that opportunity? The second question is, um, you know, you did share with us earlier on about what different colors mean generally, like we do know blue is for men and pink is for women. Mm -hmm. and the types of graphs and what exactly data they can be used to present. So mm -hmm. are there also certain symbols that specifically are associated with a kind of illustration? For example, I do remember th something to do with a tree and in presentations you'd say, okay, there is a, this whole list of certain ideas mm -hmm. that are associated with something and they are never supposed to be mixed when you're presenting any data on infographics. Thank you very much. Oh, sure, okay. okay. Um, so for your first question about customization and data wrapper, I would say it depends on how customized you wanna get. Um, I know that there are several US publications that use data wrapper for like everything, like that's their in-house like, um, like uh, graphic maker. Uh, like the LA Times here in Los Angeles, this is what they use for all of their graphics. Um, they have an enterprise version, which is like a paid version. Um, so they can brand it as their own, but in like integrate it into their like web publishing platform. Um, so they can get a little bit more customized. And I don't know how much that costs. Um, but I know for a lot of smaller publications, they just use the free version. And it seems to work just fine for them. Um, I worked in uh, the last place that I worked in a newsroom. We used the free version, and it, it seemed to do everything that we needed. Um, it, the only thing was it wasn't um, like specifically branded as ours. But you can export the PNG into something like Photoshop or Illustrator, and then add things to it, or if you wanted to. Um, and then the other question that you had about. Um, specific things to like stay away from or um, like symbols um, to, you know, not use in association with other things. Um, I would say that, yeah, there are. Um, I think it's a, a matter of remembering that every data point that you um, that you are visualizing represents some sort of humanity behind it. Like there's a person behind all of it. So that's what guides me in determining like symbols and um, and a lot of aspects of the visualization. So like if I'm talking, if I've done a visualization about like, you know, a school shooting, I'm not going to use like little gun symbols or anything because I'm talking about, you know, kids who have lost their lives. I might use like, you know, maybe a little student symbol or something like a little person or like maybe a pencil or a little desk or something. But, you know, it's just more like sensitivity to you know, the situation. So I don't think there's anything specifically to stay away from unless it's just downright offensive, but I think it's more like a sensitivity to the subject, so. Okay, we have another question. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for the session. So far, we are oh, enjoying yes. it and personally, I appreciate it. Uh, it's interesting, but now, my interest is different content, different types of content. So how can we, or how can I make money out of it? Can I package a certain kind or a particular category of content and use this same model software and this same method and make money out of that content if possible? Kindly take me through that, take us through that. Wait, I didn't understand the last part. Can you take the same method of what to make money? Uh, the, 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 the same method, like what we are going through now, what you're teaching us about. Can't I get, uh, can't I get a particular 
category of high no type of content and make money out of it if possible. Kindly tell us to do that. Oh, like oh. monetizing this content? Is that what you're saying? Out of data wrapper. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Um, I think if I'm understanding you correctly, I think you can, as long as the data and the information that you're putting into it is original. So I think that if you were putting it on some sort of a site or into some sort of project that did make money, that's okay. Like lots of organizations that make money use this program. It's, a, it's an open source program. So they do it, basically they offer it like with a non with a, um, what do you call it? Not creative commons, but it's a license that allows you to do basically whatever you want with it. Like whether you're making money or whether you're not, but if you want the extra features, you have to pay for it. But other than that, you can use it. It's like a, it's a service. Um, it's the ability for you to be able to, um, to use it as you want to. So. I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, another question here. Okay. Uh, thank you, Donna, for, for that answer. Actually, you answered uh, the, the last part of your answer, answered my uh, part of the question. The question is, okay. uh, the, the copyright associated with the work that I produce, um, can I, for example, be able to, to, to save it? Uh, can I be able to access that, uh, that, that file after maybe a year or two years? How, how long can it be available online? Oh, okay. Um, data wrapper, as far as I know, you, once you create your account, it's yours. I mean, unless the company goes under, it's just there, unless you delete it. Like it's not, it doesn't go away. There's not a limit on what you can create. Right now, right now there's no limit on the number of things that you can create. There are some programs where you, like once you hit 10 or 20, you have to like stop. But right now there's no limit that I know of for the free version, so. Either that or I just haven't hit it. But I, um, yeah, as far as I know, you should be fine. I know that your information will not be lost. Um, I would recommend that as you're creating things to download the, the image files of them so that they're not lost and at least you have some record of them and to also um, save the links as to where you, um, like copy the links somewhere, the data wrapper links. Um, so that they are, they live somewhere and you don't have to rely on the program to like go back into the program to find them. Um, but other than that, um, I would, it's a pretty reliable program. I don't see it going anywhere. There are millions of people who use it. So I don't imagine that they're, it, they're in danger of folding. I hope that helps. I would definitely be confident in using it for the long term. Okay, um, thank you, Dana. I think we have no more questions from here. Okay. Just to thank you for your insightful session and sharing all these tools. Um, yes, I think you're also sharing your contacts. Uh, yes. We also share them uh, with the journalists here. It has been very interesting. Thank you for your time. Any closing remarks you'd like to give as we end? No, I'd just like to say thank you so much for your time and for your attention and for your um, really interesting and um, insightful questions. Um, I've really enjoyed speaking with you all. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions or if you have like a project or something that you would like to, um, you have questions on like how to get going with data visualization or you want to chat more about this stuff, um, my email um, or reach out to me on Twitter are great ways to communicate with me. It may take me a day or two to get back to you, but I will write back to you. So 
Um, and I'll drop these in the chat before I, um, before I go um, so that you have access to them. So, but all I right. hope this is helpful for you all. Yeah, yes, it has been very helpful indeed. All right. Um, I wish you all a really good uh, rest of your training. Thank you. Have a good day, too. Oh, you're so welcome. Let me drop this in. And I'll get going. Bye. They want to give you flowers, Dana, before you go. Oh, flowers. Wonderful. I would love that. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll settle for some, some good feedback online. Bye. <laughs> All right. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs>